How many know that he is the only one that matters in this world today? He's the one that holds us together. He's the one that keeps us. He's the one that watches over us. He is Jesus Christ. The name above all other names. I know that there are people out there who like to say he's just a man. And they're trying to debunk the Bible. And they're trying to do all this and do all that. Well, you know what? The Bible is the only thing that we can go to for comfort, for strength. He is the, 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 the Bible is what we turn to when we need relief from suffering. That is what we need to do. We need to be turning to the Word of God. And we need to remember what is going on as we look at this world around us. How many know that this world is a mess right now? I'm not talking just about the United States. I'm talking about the entire world is a, just a mess right now. And even though there's so much chaos in the world, we know that Jesus is still holding this all together. And so we need to, as, as we come together, as we remember this, there is, uh, I do want to, I'm going to pray for our students that are going to go be, be heading back to school uh, at the end of service. Tomorrow's the first day of school. How many we know we need to pray for our kids as they go to the war zone known as the school system, right? And so we need to be praying for them. I, we, we will be praying for them at the end of service, but I do want to let everyone know that uh, one of our uh, customers, one of our uh, people that we have worked with for uh, a couple years now. Uh, he is at the hospital. His name is Steve Bellini. He is at the hospital right now, and he's been he's actually been telling me and talking to me up until the time when he was in the hospital. He was taking he was taken to mission in Asheville. He's got cancer in his throat, and um, they said it's too it's too far. And uh, at some point in time, I'm hoping to get with him. I'm hoping to possibly go see him in the hospital at some point, maybe this week, um, and, and to talk to him about his soul and talk to him about uh, the salvation in Jesus Christ, because that's the most important thing. And, you know, we can do all we can serve all the meals we want to. But if we can't minister to those and, and help them in their time of suffering through the power of Jesus Christ, then what we're doing is for nothing. Sunday mornings, Wednesdays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, it doesn't matter when. It doesn't matter what we do. If, it, if, if we can't look to them and offer them hope in Jesus Christ, then we're doing it all wrong and we're doing it for the wrong reasons. Amen? It's quiet there. Real quiet. But that leads us into... What we're going to be talking about today as we continue our, our, our series on mirrors. As we continue the series on mirrors, we're going to be looking at the book of James and we're going to be coming out of chapter 1, verses 2 through 8 as our main text today. And before we get there, I, I, just, I want to know something. How many check the forecast? The weather forecast. How many check that yesterday, today? Everybody, is the forecast always right? Well, how many change the forecast daily? Why do we do that? Changes every thirty minutes. But why do we can? Why do we go back and why do we believe what the weather forecasters say if it's unreliable? Things that make you go, hmm, right? And seriously, we know, okay, so I, I've got it. I, I, this is what I pulled up yesterday. And it's interesting because it's always wrong. Always. Yesterday it said today the high is going to be 84 degrees and sunny. Uh, uh, that was yesterday. Today it's 86 degrees and sunny. Tomorrow, 88 degrees. Tuesday, 90 degrees. The, the, the funny thing is, it never ends up being what they say it's going to be temperature-wise. Have you ever noticed that? Never. They're guessing. But yet we go to it and we look to the weather forecast religiously, do we not? I remember our first year in uh, Lebanon. We moved from Waynesburg, Pennsylvania. No, yeah, Waynesburg, Pennsylvania to Lebanon, Pennsylvania. And as we were moving, 
the, 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 the people of Waynesburg were, were, were giving us a hard time and they were saying, oh, you're moving out of the snow belt. You're moving out of the snow belt. And so we get to the western side, the, the eastern side of the state where they do they, they do typically see less snow. It's kind of like here. Uh, it's kind of hot in the summertime and they, they see less snow. They see more snow than we do here. But, they, you know, they, they see less snow than when the western Pennsylvania. That's where all the mountains are. And... So we get there, and our first winter there, they were calling for maybe two inches of snow. You know how much snow we got? A foot and a half. You remember that? We got a foot and a half of snow, and they were only calling for two inches. I learned right then, in my, <laughs> in my young age, I can't believe anything the weather forecasters say, but yet... Even though we can't believe what they say and we know they're going to get it wrong, we still look to them for guidance on what to wear tomorrow. We might be better off just doing it ourselves, right? But, you know, I mean, it, it, it's just one of those things. But, and so I just, I just, just keep that in mind because... We have a tendency not to look to the Word of God or not believe everything the Word of God says. We're humans. We question everything, right? That's what we do. We question everything. And so I want you to look at your neighbor and say, am I ready? Just look and say, am I ready? Ready for what? That's not important at this moment in time. Just look at him and say, am I ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? I mean, and now, now look back at him and say, do you believe? See, there, there was a show that, and, and I've actually got a shirt that has an X Wing fighter and it says, I want to believe. If you watch the X Files, you know what that what that's referring to. That's that's one of the that's one of the statements. It's one of the posters on the X Files. I want to believe. Another one is the truth is out there. The truth is out there. We know where the truth is. The truth is out there. There's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of people talking in this world today. But I just want you to I just want you to keep in mind and, and remember the weather forecasters. We 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 have a tendency to believe them even though we know they're going to be wrong. We have a tendency to believe them even though we know that they are going to be wrong. But what about the Word of God? We say we believe, but do we really? Do you believe this morning? Are you ready? See, in James chapter one, and I know you're, you're, you're looking at me like a gate, like a goat looking at a new gate, and you're confused. So let, let's just go on ahead of the scripture and see what the word of God tells us today. In James one, verses two through, two through four is what we're going to open up with first. It says, "Consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials." Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Mm. So we look at what James is saying here and we see that he is saying, first off, count it all joy. Count what joy? The test. The test, the trial, the tribulation, the test is what we need to be counting as joy. As school starts tomorrow, there's going to be a lot of kids that are not happy when their first test comes up. How many like taking tests in school? Anybody in here? You guys like that? Oh, <laughs> my wife, go <laughs> here. How about you kids? You kids like taking tests in school? It depends. Okay. What, what does it depend on? If you know it or not. Okay. If you know the material. If you know the material, you're prepared for it, right? If you know the material, you think you're going to pass the test, right? If you don't know the material, you dread the test, don't you? Now, there are those who don't test well. I, I knew a young man that was in my youth group years ago, and, and, and he just, he flat out did not test well. It took him nine times to pass his driver's test. 
he just did not, he was an intelligent kid, he just did not test well. But see, in all of that, we see that James is saying we need to consider the test great joy, okay? So with that, let's, let's put that into the school again. How many would consider a test great joy? I don't know. See, now, now you guys are just fibbing. You, you, man, well, never mind. <laughs> I, I didn't, I never considered a test great joy. I never considered it great joy. But you see, the thing is, we all have tests that come our way. Troubles, trials, tribulation, COVID, cancer, leukemia, diabetes. Well, I mean, you, you fill the blank in there. Think of something that you go through in your life. Bankruptcy, divorce. Hard times, hard tests come our way, don't they? Sometimes we bring them on ourselves, don't we? Sometimes we bring them on ourselves. But sometimes things happen that just aren't our fault. That we are at no fault. We are at no fault. And there's no choice, no decision be be behind these things. Sometimes things happen. And James is saying to count it all joy. A test of our faith. A test of whether or not we really do believe what the word of God says. I saw a meme yesterday. I, I didn't, I, I'm not, I'm not going to put that one up here. But I did see something yesterday that, 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 was, that, that was really interesting. It was very well said. Just because someone puts their faith in Jesus does not mean we don't know that COVID's out there. It just means that I refuse to live my life in fear of something that Jesus is in control of. I thought that was really well, very well put. And, and, and you know, it, it doesn't say consider it all fear, right? That's not what James says. Consider it all fear. Now, again, this is that. It's just this is something that's on our mind. We can we can we can look at uh, Afghanistan. We can look at uh, another earthquake has hit Haiti. I mean, we can look at all these other all these other things that that we can plug in here. It doesn't matter what we go through. What it says is that we should consider it great joy. Why? Why should we consider it great joy? Why should we, in another translation, it actually says, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Consider it an opportunity for great joy whenever you experience various trials. How many of us do that? My goodness, we, 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 we see, we, I just heard it this week, somebody was complaining about snow. They don't like that. They like winter time, but they don't like snow. And I'm like, okay. You, I mean, you, 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 we, we, we get, we get a sniffle. We get a sniffle and we begin to complain. We get a headache and we complain. We, I mean, we, we get the smallest thing wrong with us and we begin to complain. Do we count it all joy? Do we consider it an opportunity for great joy? I mean, th think about your life. I, I, I know what happens in my life. When I'm not feeling well, everybody knows it. I don't feel well. I'm whining. I'm complaining. You can ask that woman sitting right over there. The biggest thing men are here. She will tell you I don't do well when I don't feel well. It's easy for us to, to you know, I mean, I mean, you think about it. I saw one of my friends I used to work with on Facebook complaining about Wells Fargo. There was suspicious activity. He called it in and they froze him out of all of his accounts. And he said, it's a good thing I had some money set aside or I would have been with nothing until next week when they send me my new card. I mean, if you I mean, think about it, we just we, we, we have all these problems. And I, I've had my issues with Wells Fargo, so I totally feel him. <laughs> we shake our fist at Wells Fargo as we drive by. Ugh. But the, the, this is what happens, though. We have things affect us 
And the thing is, it should never affect our joy. I've got a question. Is happiness and joy the same thing? See, when Nikki and I have talked about this, so she knows where I'm going with this. But you, think about it. Is happiness and joy the same thing? Notice that the Bible never talks about your happiness. You ever notice that? Never talks about your happiness. It talks about your joy, though. So what's the difference between joy and happiness? Anybody know? Happiness is are, are outward things. Outward things can affect your happiness. Just go drive in traffic. You can be you you can you can have be having a great day until you get in that traffic jam, and then your happiness is gone, right? <laughs> your happiness is gone. But that should never affect your joy. Your joy is inward. Joy is inward because trust me, when you go through trials, when you go through tribulations, when you go through suffering, when you go through these things in your life on the outward, you're going to need something to help you get through. You're going to need something on the inside to help you get through. And there's only one thing that can be on the inside of you that can give you that kind of joy that is that, that, that sustains you to get through it. And that is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only one that you can find joy in. And you think about you think about all the apostles. Think about Paul and Silas. I know we refer to them a lot. But they had been beat. They had been left for dead. They had, I mean, Paul, he just Paul alone. He'd been shipwrecked. He'd been beat so bad they thought he was dead and left him on the side of the road. He, he had been, I mean, just numerous times he was beat. Paul and Silas are beat one more time and thrown into jail. Did that affect their happiness? Absolutely. You want to get beat 39 times with a cat of nine tails? See how you feel? See if you're happy about it? Did it affect their happiness? Absolutely. Did it affect their joy? Absolutely not. Because you can't sit in a dirty dungeon when you've been beat half to death with a cat of nine tails, bones and metal and, and, and rocks on the, on the end of those things. And those, those soldiers, they knew what to do. They knew how to inflict pain. The most pain possible. That was their job. And so you, you, you're beat to death. Almost to death. And then thrown in prison. Would that affect your happiness? Absolutely. But it should never affect your joy. That's why Paul and Silas, they looked at each other and said, what was that we were singing last week? Let's start singing that again. And they start singing. They start praising God. They start magnifying Him because He is greater than their suffering. He is greater than their problems. They got their eyes on Him and began to praise Him and thank Him for what they had gone through. And then the earthquake came, shook the very foundations, and then every door was open, every chain fell off, and and, and, and there was a great revival that took place in that jail cell because of their joy. They counted it all joy. They considered it great joy to suffer for the cause of Christ. So happiness is going to be affected. But your joy never should. If Jesus Christ is Lord of your life, you should never Allow the things that happen to you on the outside affect your joy that's inward. I know this is a hard one. See, this is why we have this mirror up here. It's time for us to look inside this mirror. It's time to look inside this mirror and say, do I believe? Am I ready? Am I ready for the test that's coming? Do I really believe the word of God? See, James says... The reason we go through and we should count it all joy is because we know that the testing that comes our way, it's only to improve our faith. It's only to perfect our faith. 
That's the reason we go through things. Think about it. If you didn't go through things, the, the, think about the think about the bodybuilders that go to the that go to the gyms that go work out. Think about people that are fit. They didn't get like that overnight, and they didn't get like that by just wishing. Because if that happened, I would I, I would I would have six packs right now. I'd just have a six pack and not have it under all this laundry. No, okay, failed. I I, I no, seriously, I, you know, that's. But it doesn't. It comes with work. And if you don't go work out, you can say all day long you want to be fit. You want to have washboard abs, that six-pack abs. But unless you go do something about it, you'll never see the result you're wanting to see. That's spiritual muscles. That's right. You see... That's what. That's why we go through testing. That's why we go through trials. That's why we go through tribulation to improve our faith. Because because the testing of our faith, as you can see there, it produces endurance. How many want to make it to the end? How many know that we've got some trials that's going to be coming our way? The church has trials. We may not be at this time next year. You never know. This time next year, we may not be able to meet together uh, for different reasons. They may put it in place that we can't meet together. It's illegal to meet together. Think about that. Do you, is your faith good enough to have you to endure to the end? Who? That's why we go through trials to strengthen our faith, to produce that endurance. Because you see that endurance, we, we need to have that endurance in order for it to have its full effect so that we can be what? So that we, it's still up there, so that we can be what? Mature and? Mature and complete. Lacking nothing. So, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that you're not complete right now? I'm not. I am not complete. How do I know I'm not complete? Because I'm still here. I am not complete because I am still here. I have not, quote unquote, arrived yet. My glorious body is still on the waiting. I'm still waiting my glorious body. Is there anybody here that's still waiting your glorious body? Is there anybody here that's still waiting to see Jesus face to face, face to face, standing in heaven? So that means you haven't arrived yet. That means you are still incomplete. That means there are areas in your life where you are still immature. Oh, pastor, wait a minute. That's what it says. How many know? I mean, I'll be the first to tell you. There are times when I, I react terribly. I react like an immature child. I'm 48 years old, and I, I, I react like an immature child. I'm big enough to say it. How about y'all? Would you be able to say that? That means that we're not there yet. We have not arrived yet. It doesn't matter how old we are. Until we see Jesus face to face, until we step into glory or he comes back and takes his church away, we are not complete yet. We are not mature yet. We have not arrived. And so that means we are still lacking things. Amen? So we need to have our faith tested. So do you really believe what the Bible says? Are you ready for the test? Do you really believe what it says? See, because we need to understand, and the second point that I'm, that, that, that I'm getting to is that 100% equals perfection. And we've already talked, we've already, we've already touched on this. 100%. How many know that's the perfect score for a test in school? 100%, right? You missed no answers. You got everything right. You did well. The teacher looks and grades your paper and says, that is excellent work, 100%, right? How many can say I pass every spiritual test 100%? Would Jesus look at our paper of our life and say, you did a good job there, 100%. 
or do we fail? Oh, see, that 100% equals perfection. And see, this is what James goes on to say in 5 through 8. He says, now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith. There's that faith again without doubting. For the doubter is like the surging sea driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. Hmm. Some hard stuff right there, isn't it? Lacking nothing. Let's, let, let, let's think about that. At the end of verse 4, James talks about how we were lacking. We, we were to lack nothing. We, we, we need to go to God. What is it we need? What, what is it here he's saying that we need to go to God and ask for? Because he says that God is going to give generously and ungrudgingly. What is it that he is saying we need to ask for? Wisdom. So let me ask y'all this. In your prayer time, when's the last time you asked the Lord for wisdom in your life? How many know that wisdom is more precious than gold? Wisdom is more precious than your possessions. Wisdom is better than, 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 than asking for God's blessings. Ooh. See, as we experience these trials, as we experience the suffering, as we experience these things we go through, the goal is that we reach perfection. We get that 100% gold star on the test of our life. That is, the, that, that is the goal for God for us. But the only way we can do that is if we ask him for wisdom in times of suffering. Notice he doesn't say, ask for healing. Ask for that wisdom in times of suffering, in times of trial, in times of tribulation. Ask for wisdom. Wisdom. See, verse 4, James is telling his readers that they should be mature and complete, lacking in nothing, right? Right? And then he goes on to say, if you lack wisdom. Notice he didn't say if you lack anything else. If you lack money, if you lack fame, if you lack, uh, if you lack notoriety, if you lack, if you lack a house, if you lack a car. He doesn't say that. He said, if you lack wisdom. And how many can I, let's see a show of hands. How many can honestly say you have lacked wisdom in something this week? I have lacked wisdom. So that means we need to be going and asking for wisdom. For wisdom. See, we're not there yet. We're not there. If we asked you, have you arrived yet? Well, you can you can put on your pretty clothes and you can you can act the part and you can do the part, but when when you look in this mirror. Ask yourself, and you ask yourself, have I arrived yet? And you're truly honest, and you're looking through God's eyes at your life, you would look at that mirror and say, I'm not there. I'm not even close. Not even close. The only thing that I can say is that I have Jesus Christ in me. And even though I have Jesus Christ in me, I still fail. I'm still not perfect. I still need his righteousness. So what is it we're supposed to do then? You see, James says that, we're to, that, that, that we lack wisdom. We need to ask for wisdom. He instructs the reader to ask for wisdom. He didn't, he didn't say, again, I've already said it, but he didn't say ask for more money, ask for fame, ask for stardom, ask for a notoriety. He said, ask for what? Wisdom. And God will give it to you. What was the one thing that Solomon asked for? More wives. That was, the, no, that was definitely not it. <laughs> 
Solomon asked for wisdom. I don't know where that wisdom went when he got all those women around him. He, he lacked wisdom there. As he began to collect the wives, he really lacked wisdom. But, see, but think about it. We are to ask for wisdom. And what did the Lord say when he asked for wisdom instead of riches, instead of more, instead of more possessions? The Lord looked at him and said, because you have asked for wisdom, I am going to bless you with everything else. Right? And he became the richest king ever to live on the face of the earth. That's what they, I mean, you look at it. When you when you're covering everything in gold, you got some pretty good you, you, you got it made. You got some pretty good riches, right? When you begin to cover everything in gold and silver, all because Solomon asked for wisdom. Wisdom is what he realized that he needed. See, not only are we to ask for wisdom. But notice what James is saying here. Not only are we to ask for wisdom, but we are, we are to ask for wisdom in faith. Now, we go through the trials, the tribulations, the struggles that we go through in this life to increase our faith, right? And so now, here James is saying, once, you, once that faith is increased, ask for wisdom within faith without doubting. That's something that we struggle with, isn't it? God's promised this. God, God says he would take care of me, but I don't have enough money to make the bills this week. I've got God, God promises healing for me, but I've got but, but I, I continuously struggle with this sickness that I've got. He says, don't ask for healing, ask for wisdom in faith, without doubting. It's, not, it's, it's interesting how he says that, isn't it? Ask in faith without doubting. Why? Because the doubter is like the wind, is like the sea. The surging sea is what he said, driven and tossed by the winds. The doubter that he said it says that person. Let's just say the doubter should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. The doubter is double-minded and unstable in all his ways. We go through trials, we go through struggles, we go through suffering to increase our faith so that then we can we can ask in faith without doubting and in, 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 and, and it helps our doubts to be squashed. So that we are not like that double-minded person who's unstable in everything that we do. What? Exactly. That was one of the greatest statements ever made in the, in, in, in the New Testament. Lord, I do believe, but help my unbelief. I do believe. And he, he, he said, I do believe, but then he went and acknowledged the fact there are parts of him that does doubt, that has unbelief. I do believe, but help my unbelief. See, in Mark 11, 22 through 25, this is what the word tells us here. Jesus replied to them, have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Let's stop right there. How many know that there are promises within the word of God that we can declare and we can pray and we can hold on to in times of trial, struggles, and tribulation, in times of sickness, in times of health, in times of, of death, in times of life. There are things in the scripture that we can hold on to. How many know that to be true? Why don't we then? Jesus said, have faith in God. 
I don't understand this this thing, but you know what? If God looks at me and says, speak to speak to Grandfather Mountain and tell that thing to be removed from there and cast into the sea, if God tells me to do it, I better have faith that he's going to do something. Right? If you say to this mountain, be removed and thrown into the sea, if you don't doubt, we serve a great big God, don't we? Do we doubt that God can do that? Whew. See, that's that's the analytical part of us. Why would God say do that? Why would he use me? There's people like Billy Graham and there's people like, you know, you name off some of the great, great, the, the great men of faith in history. Why would he use me? Why? 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 That, that, see, that, that's the, that, why? Just stop there. That's doubt. That's the doubt within us. Why? We want, we want to know the answers. We don't see the future. We don't know what God has in store. We don't know what God is going to do in the future. Only he knows that. And so if he speaks to us, we just need to act in faith and believe. That's what Jesus said. He goes on to say, therefore, I tell you, everything you pray and ask for, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, now here, here's the hard part. Because when you pray, you're supposed to listen to the voice of God, right? That means shut up and listen to him. Because he's the Jesus. These are the words of Jesus. If you got problems with this, go to him. He said, and whenever you stand praying, if you have any, anything against anyone, forgive him. So that your father in heaven will also forgive you your wrongdoing. Those are hard words to hear. They've not apologized to me. Forgive him. You don't know what they've done. Forgive him. But, but Lord. Lord. They broke the law. Forgive him. God, I don't, I, I don't like what you're telling me. Forgive him. Forgive him. That is something that maybe this is why we don't see the power of God falling in our churches anymore. Maybe this is why we don't see the power of God falling in our lives anymore. Because we've got we've got these hard feelings toward other people. We've got these hard feelings toward people that have done us wrong. That we don't understand the injustice in this world. God says forgive them. Not just forgive them. And, and it, but he says forgive him. So that your father in heaven can forgive you. Wait a minute. Now see that goes back to this mirror thing. We need to look in the mirror. Spiritually. And ask ourselves. Do I have anything against anyone else? I've got an ex-wife. It took me a long time to live by this. I've got family members that have hurt me so terribly bad. It took me a long time to get to this point. I'm not saying it's easy. Trust me, it's not. But when you stand and you see yourself through the eyes of God in the spiritual mirror of your life. And you say, Lord, reveal to me. Is there someone that I have not forgiven? Because I want you to forgive me. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, in other words, if we don't forgive people. We will not be forgiven. We will not be forgiven of our wrongdoing if we can't forgive others. Oh. 
this is hard. I mean, when you when you talk about looking in the mirror and, and examining yourself the way God sees you, it's hard stuff. It's hard stuff. But but I'm going through that. Well, I don't. I don't. I don't I, it doesn't matter. You need to forgive. You need to look at that hard and ask: Is there someone I need to I need to forgive this morning? Is there someone I need to forgive right now? See, Jesus makes it clear that when we have faith in him, anything we ask for according to the will of God will be done. But if we've got forgiveness in our heart, if we've got unforgiveness in our hearts, we've got bitterness in our hearts. God is not obligated to hear our prayers. Oh, my pastor, wait a minute. He hears everything, does he? Does he really? I mean, yeah, he does hear everything. But he is not obligated to hear you if you've got unforgiveness in your heart. He is not obligated to forgive and to hear you if you are acting in disobedience. He is not obligated to bless you past your last act of disobedience. And forgiveness is an act, uh, unforgiveness is an act of disobedience. Because Jesus hung on the cross after he had been beaten so bad that the word tells us that he was he, he, he was that he was unrecognizable as a human being. They couldn't even tell who he was. He was beat that bad. He had a skin ripped off of him. He was hanging there naked. He was hanging there exposed. He was hanging there uh, dying a criminal's death when he was the most innocent man that ever walked the earth. And he looked out there and said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. The ultimate act of forgiveness was a what was what was seen in, in Jesus saying those words. If he can forgive those that did that to him, and he can forgive you and me, then we should be able to forgive others of things they've done to us. That's hard stuff, isn't it? That's hard stuff. But according to what we see and according to what Jesus said, if we want our prayers answered, if we want God to hear us, we've got to make sure that we're acting like Jesus. And in order for us to act like Jesus, we've got to forgive. We've got to forgive. See, he laid down that stipulation that we've got to forgive if we expect God to hear us. If we expect God to forgive us, we've got to forgive. You've got to forgive those you will never hear an apology from. There are people in this world. And, and what, what it does, and, and this is how it ties into the suffering. This is how it ties into trials and tests. And this is how it ties in. Okay, you ready? What happens when you don't forgive somebody, say 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 somebody somebody did you dirty, did you wrong, she cheated you out of money, they, they they reneged on a deal that was set in stone, backed out of a contract, as Nikki has seen so many times. Yeah, I kid you not, there, there, there was a contract she had. It was the day before closing, and they backed out. They didn't care how much they, they didn't care about the money that were, they were going to lose. They backed out. Two of those. Two. So think about it. What happens when we don't forgive? We become bitter. And then what happens then? It affects everything. It torments us. Puts us into suffering. So much so that, 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 we, that, that, it, that it poisons everything else in our life. To the point of us losing our health. Right? Doctors have seen that. Doctors have, have seen what stress can do to the heart. How, what, what stress does to the body. And when you have that bitterness in your heart, it puts you through suffering. It puts you through suffering. So you get to this point to where your body's breaking down because of bitterness. So do you really believe what the word of God says? 
Because what we just read is in the Word of God. How many know that? How many know that's in there? I showed it to you. So you, everybody better raise your hand. I showed it to you because it's there. We struggle with that. We put ourselves through suffering. And then we under, then, then we looked at God and said, I don't know why I'm going through this. We put ourselves there. We don't forgive people. And so, and so as we look at this, this is why James is saying we need to have wisdom. We need to have the wisdom of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we need to ask for wisdom to forgive those who have done us wrong. We need to ask for wisdom to forgive those that have hurt us so badly. And what it does, when you forgive, here, here's what it does. It releases them into the hand of the Father. And He will deal with them the way He sees fit and you are free. You are free from that bitterness. You are free I'm telling you, when you forgive somebody, when you truly forgive somebody, it's like the, the, a millstone has been lifted off of you. See, Jesus has provided us the answer key, though, to, to what we're talking about today. He's provided us with the answer key. We go through a test, we and, and, and hopefully we can make that, we, we, we can get that 100%. But the thing is... We have the answer key right here. We have the answer key in the Word of God. Why don't we why don't we pass the test? Because we fail to look at the Word of God. We fail. It, it is an open book test. Not just that, but it's the answer key. How many, how many wish that you were in you were in school, the teacher would give you the answer key so that you can make that 100 percent How many wish that? I did. Man, if they could just give me that answer key, I'd be all right. We have the answer key to what we're talking about today. We have the answer key right here. It's an open book test. Not just that, but the answers are all right there. The answers are all right there. See, in John chapter 16, verses 31 and 33, this is what it says. Jesus responded to them, do you now believe? So look at your neighbor and say, do you believe? Do you now believe? Look at your neighbor. Do you now believe? Verse 32 goes on to say, indeed, an hour is coming and has come when each of you will be scattered into it to his own home and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Of course, he is talking here about, about the fact that every one of the disciples were going to desert him in his greatest time of need at the crucifixion, the trial. There was nobody there. He was alone except with the Father. He goes on to say, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You may have peace. It doesn't matter what the media wants to tell us. As long as we believe this word and what Jesus said, we should have peace. Right? It doesn't matter what our friends say. As long as we know his word, have his word hidden in our hearts, they can say all they want to. But because Jesus has told us these things, we should have peace. Peace. Now, that's the preface to what he's about to say. He goes on to say after he says, I tell you these things so that you can have peace. He goes on to say, you possibly could have suffering in this world. Is that what he said? You possibly could have suffering. There's a 50-50 chance you'll suffer. There's a 60-40 chance you'll suffer. Is that what he said? No, no. He says, and this is with 100% certainty, you will have suffering in this world. You will. That's a definite. You will have suffering in this world. Whether it's for the name of Jesus Christ, whether it's sickness, whether it's 
whether it's you lost all your money, whether, whether family betrays you, whatever it is, you will have suffering in this world. How many are still in this world? Again, if you're sitting here today, that means you're in this world. Do you see how all this is working? He goes on to say, be courageous. I have conquered the world. So Jesus has already given us the answer key. He has already given us the answers to our struggles, to our trials, to our tribulations. And sometimes we go through things and we need to understand it's going to happen. If you're living in this world, there's going to be some type of suffering that you're going to go through. Just get ready for it. Are you ready? Are you ready for the test that's going to come your way? Are you ready? Have you looked in the mirror and have you asked God today, am I ready for the test that's about to come? Do I believe? See, Jesus has already told us what to do and he's given us the answer key. He's given it to us. Jesus looked at his disciples in that verse and says, do you believe now? Do you now believe? Is he looking at you today saying that? Do you now believe? Do you now believe? See, we talked about some of this stuff on Wednesday. If you missed it, we had a great discussion on Wednesday about the current events that, that are going on. And how that ties into scripture and how Jesus is coming back soon. Are you ready? See, we go in. Facebook is a horrible thing, but it can be a good thing as well. Because sometimes the Lord can use things on Facebook to minister to you. These are just some of the things that, that you know, this one right here, I saved this to my memories. It said, when sadness fills your heart, when tears flow in your eyes, always remember these three things. God is with you, still with you, always with you. Maybe you're going through something today. You need to hear that. God is with you. Always with you. Or still with you. And always with you. Maybe you need to hear that today. Maybe you need to hear something like this today. Hardships often prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. That's C.S. Lewis. We, told, we, 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 we read some of C.S. Lewis's wisdom on Wednesday. Hardships often prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. We go through suffering. We go through hardships. We go through things in this life. Because there's a, it, it, most of the time you're being prepared for your next step. You're being prepared for your next level. Don't complain about the hardships. Don't complain about the things that you're going through. Because God is allowing it to happen to strengthen your faith. Because it could come down to it. This time next year, this could be us. This time next year, this could be us. Church in Afghanistan says we will gather and likely die. Church in America, we will gather. And what that says right there is unless there's a cookout, birthday, birthday party, or it's a nice day, or there's a chance of rain, or I'm a little tired. Then I won't gather. We could be in the exact place that the church in Afghanistan is right now. I didn't. I didn't put this one up there. I had, there was another thing that's very. It's really disturbing. I saw. There are somebody posted. They've got underground pastors in Afghanistan right now. That were abandoned and left. Brothers and sisters in Christ. That are over there. They've got 22. That are over there. In case you didn't know. The Taliban is going door to door right now. Searching for people. Searching for people like you and me. And this post said, these 22 pastors, he spoke to one of them. 
And they said every one of them is expecting to die. Because they are Christians. We get a hangnail when we complain here in this country, don't we? Can't believe I'm going through this suffering, God. Can't believe I'm going through this trial of a hangnail. Help me, deliver me. We have men and women that are in Afghanistan right now that are fearing they're going to die. No, they're not fearing. Because when you have Jesus Christ, you don't fear death. But they are expecting to die. Are you ready? Are you ready? That's the question today. Are you ready? Hardships, trials, suffering, tribulations, they all come to us in different forms. I'm not saying that, you know, someone that receives a diagnosis of cancer, I'm not saying that's not suffering because that is. I'm not saying that somebody that is suffering for, I mean, they're going through unbelievable things in their lives. I'm not saying that's not suffering. That is suffering, trials, tri tribulation. They all approach us in different ways. They all do. I don't know of anybody in here today that has that is being hunted down because you're a Christian. But are we ready? Are we ready to pass the test? Say that happens today. Say they bust through this door. AK-47 in hand. Look at you and say, you either deny Jesus Christ or I'm going to shoot you in the head. What would you do? Are you ready for that test? I've got too much to live for. I've got, what about my grandkids? What about, what, what, I, I've got to go to work tomorrow. What about, what, what about it? We have to be ready for the test, no matter what it is. Not saying that's going to happen, but it could. I can see this country headed down that direction, right? This country is headed in that direction. There is a war against us. If you're a Christian, there's a war against us today. Right now, in this country, they don't want to hear what you have to say. As a matter of fact, they want to silence you if they can. Are you ready for the test that's coming? Are you ready for the persecution? Are you ready for the trials? Are you ready to have your faith strengthened? Are you ready? Are you ready? See, today, we've got to look in the mirror of our heart and ask God to reveal to us if there's anything in us that needs to be removed. We've got to look in the mirror and really see ourselves as God sees us. Does he see us as counting our sufferings and trials and tribulations? Does he see us counting it as joy? Or does he, or does God see us saying one thing and acting a completely different way? Do we really believe what God's word says? Do we really believe as we look in the mirror of our heart? Are we Ready. Every head bowed, every eye closed. This is a, it's an interesting world we're living in. It's uh, that's the best thing that I can say. This world is against everything that has to do with God. The ways of the world are completely against the ways of God. But we've got to be ready. Struggles, trials, tribulations are coming our way. We've got to be ready. Are you ready for it? How many in here, and even on way of Facebook, would say, you know what, Pastor? 
I'm lacking. I'm not quite ready. I'm lacking faith. I'm not ready for the trials. I'm not ready for the tribulations. I'm not ready for the things that are coming my way. I'm not ready. Maybe you're in it. Maybe you're in here. You're in Facebook right now. And you're saying, I'm not ready at all because I don't know Jesus as my Savior. I realize today I don't know Jesus as my Savior. I realize that I don't believe his word. I realize that I truly, truly, I believe parts of it, but not other parts. Do, 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 these are the things you need to be asking yourself right now. Am I ready? Do I believe? Do I count my suffering as joy? Spirit of God, I ask and pray that you would move on your people. That you would move across Facebook. That you would move in the hearts of the people. Reveal things to them. Let them see themselves as you see them. Let them look in the mirror of the Holy Spirit right now. And let the Holy Spirit reveal to us. Let the Holy Spirit reveal to us things we need to remove so that we can count it all joy as we suffer in this life. I pray for your people right now. I pray for those that are watching and listening that don't know Jesus as their Savior. If that's you today, here's what I want you to do. I just want you to repeat after me. Say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for showing me that I'm not ready. Thank you for revealing to me that I've got unforgiveness in my heart. Thank you for revealing to me that I need you as my Savior. Come into my heart right now. Forgive me of my unforgiveness. Forgive me of my bitterness. Forgive me of everything that I've done wrong. Let your blood cover me and make me right in the eyes of God. I recognize that it is only by you that I can come into God's presence. I thank you for what you've done for me. I thank you for healing me. I thank you for forgiving me. And I thank you because now I am a new creation. Thank you. I love you. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, I ask and pray right now for all of those that are listening. That are, I just pray that, God, you would let them look in the mirror of their heart. Let them look through the, let them look into the mirror of the Holy Spirit and let the Spirit reveal to them the unforgiveness. Let the Spirit reveal to them their lack of faith. Let the Spirit reveal to them everything that is not like Jesus. And then let us all remove it by the mighty power of Jesus and give it to you. Father, I believe that we are to be operating in the spirit, in the, in the spirit of faith and not fear. The spirit of power and courage. Lord, I believe that we are to, as long as we have Jesus Christ, we are to be, we are to be living as an overcomer in this world. And I pray that about everyone here. As we examine ourselves, let us be the overcoming force that you meant for the church to be.